The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. I think sometimes these gyrations that we see in Chinese policy, in the economy, in foreign policy, in politics, they can reflect different parts of the Chinese government trying to figure out where their priorities are between you know, standing tall ideologically and, and making pragmatic choices. But also I think we do see sort of Xi Jinping himself offering these contradictory policy imperatives that reflect the fact that even within his thinking there can be sort of jostling priorities. In this episode, policy reversals and political impacts in China. Here to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Over the past few months, China's government has substantially recalibrated policies imposed just a few years ago. And while the lifting of the zero COVID policy has received most of the attention, there are other major shifts, including a loosening of credit regulations once deemed necessary to rescue China's debt-riddled real estate development sector, the end of a highly publicised crackdown on the country's tech industry, and a softer tone in its approach to international relations. While each of these policy adjustments are noteworthy in their own right, together they have, to a greater or lesser extent, the sense of a reversal or climb-down. Not that you'll be reading about them that way in Chinese media accounts, where there's been little or no connection made between policy turnaround and previous policy failings. So is the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing simply responding to events and steering policy as needed? Is all this policy recalibration just part of a push to reinvigorate a flagging economy? Has more overt public discontent recently over a number of issues actually had an impact on the thinking of the authoritarian state? And what, if any, is the reputational and political cost to the party when it abandons its fairly new policies and reverses course? Joining us to examine the intersection of questionable policy and unchallenged political legitimacy is New York Times Chief China Correspondent Chris Buckley, who earned a doctorate in China Studies from the Australian National University. Over several decades, Chris has been reporting on politics, foreign policy, rural issues, human rights, environment and climate change in China. Welcome back to Ear to Asia, Chris. Good to be back, Ali. As I said, there have been a number of notable policy reversals or substantial recalibrations in recent months in China. And before we go through them in more detail, Chris, to what extent do you think the various reversals add up to something bigger, a shift in tack by the party or by the leader Xi Jinping? Well, I think that's right, Ali. I think it is an important shift in tack, but that The other side of that is I don't think it amounts to a shift in strategy or long-term objectives. In other words, I think the leadership is responding to a number of pressures that really piled up, particularly in the second half of last year in 2022, with the economy, with strains on zero COVID, with China's international isolation, all bearing down on the leadership. And I think we've seen a series of responses to those problems those challenges. At the same time, I think we're seeing enough coming out of the Chinese leadership in terms of policy and messaging that I think it's going too far to say that this represents a sort of a a wholesale reversal of what Xi Jinping has been pushing for and wants to push for in the next 10 years, say. And I guess that goes to the issue of of ideology versus uh, practical policy requirements, which I will get to a little later in this conversation. But do you see the shifts linked? Is it, and from what you were just saying, is economic imperative a common theme? I think economic imperatives is one common theme and, and social pressures. The economy, obviously, domestically is most important. At the same time, we've seen a readjustment in China's uh, foreign policy, certainly in its rhetoric. That predates some of the worst problems we saw emerging in the economy. It also predates the drastic reversal in zero COVID last year as well. And to some extent, it also predates the 20th Party Congress when 
Xi Jinping claimed a third term as party leader. So there is a convergence between them, but I wouldn't see them all as being on one single track. I think what we're seeing is partly concerted shifts across a number of areas, but also, you know, as I said, a sort of convergence of, of trends in different areas that didn't necessarily have to fall in place at the same time, but have overlapped quite a bit. We'll come back to the, the current state of the government, if you like, but if we can look at some of these U-turns, and the dr- most dramatic, I think, for an outsider, at least, is the lifting of the zero COVID policy. And Beijing and China went from years of lockdowns to an almost total policy reversal in such a short space of time. And there's been a very well-documented impact of that on the Chinese people. How do you read the dumping of zero COVID so rapidly? Yes, I I think one point to make about all of these dramatic changes in policy over the past few months, Ali, is that although I saw some signs of impending change, I never predicted anything as drastic as the abandonment of zero COVID in a matter of weeks, even days. Come to answering these questions about what happened with a certain degree of humbleness. That said, I'll put aside humbleness for a little while and just hazard some ideas about what happened. And I do think Again, even within zero COVID, it was a convergence of a number of issues. One of them was the economy and the fact that zero COVID was increasingly exhausting the Chinese economy, in particular the big powerhouse provinces and cities on the eastern coastal seaboard, which is so important to China's overall economy. The other part of it which is related to that is simply the erosion of zero COVID itself. In other words, particularly with the continued spread of Omicron outbreaks in China, it was increasingly difficult for the central government and local governments to keep up this constant effort of bushfire fighting efforts against these outbreaks of the Omicron variant, whether that was in Beijing, in Shanghai, in Chongqing, in all of these cities and in smaller cities across China. The zero COVID policy worked against less infectious variants of COVID for some time, but it also required a nationwide effort in which you could bring to bear resources from across the entire country to bring in medical doctors, to bring in extra support staff to a particular city to sustain a lockdown. And when you had outbreak after outbreak multiplying last year, that was becoming increasingly difficult. So I think even before the formal abandonment of zero COVID, there were strong signs that on the ground it was already beginning to crumble. And I think that reality was beginning to seep through to top leaders like Xi Jinping in the end. And then I think in the end, the thing that forced uh, the government, the leadership to make such a rapid change in policy was probably the politics of it. And by that I mean the protests that broke out late last year over several days in which frustration with zero COVID policies boiled over in many Chinese cities, dozens of cities. And in some of those cities, some of the crowd began shouting slogans, denouncing the Communist Party, denouncing Xi Jinping, calling for freedom of the press, denouncing not just the zero COVID policies, but denouncing the authoritarian policies of the Chinese government as a whole. Now, that wasn't a majority of the protesters, but nonetheless, it was significant and no doubt alarming to the leadership to see those political messages popping up in different cities at the same time. And I suspect, we're only reading the tea leaves here, I suspect that that was a catalyst that forced the government to make a decision faster than it otherwise would have. So in other words, you had these longer term pressures from the economy and the crumbling of zero COVID already bearing down. And then the protests, I think, really forced the government's hand. And if the protests and and the way people were responding to zero COVID was a straw that broke the camel's back, how has the rapid reversal of policy been received by people? Yes, I should say, Ali, I'm I'm not in China now. I'm in Taipei at the moment. So uh, getting that sense of what public opinion is, is, is difficult if you're in China, given just its size and complexity. It's more challenging from outside, but me and my colleagues have spent some time talking to people, making lots of phone calls. And I think, as we've seen in many societies, it's a very mixed reaction. Of course, if you've had um, loved ones who have perished in this wave of infections, of COVID infections that spread across China, 
you're very likely to feel very angry, baffled, uh, frustrated about this sudden reversal, abandonment of zero COVID just in the middle of winter when infection was most likely to spread. At the same time, without slighting that sense of anger and confusion that I'm sure many people feel, talking to people in a number of cities across China in recent weeks, I was also struck that a lot of people make the point that in their lives they simply need to get on with making a living. The economy has been doing poorly for a couple of years now, especially for small business holders, uh, for people who are paying mortgages, uh, for people who are reliant on travelling around for their work. It's been a really draining time on them economically. And so I've, I've been struck by talking to people how that need just to get on with making a living It doesn't drown out their frustrations with what's happened before, but I do think it means they're much more focused on trying to rebuild their finances and rebuild their lives now rather than dwelling on the anger that they may feel from the past. So I'm sure in a society as big as China, it's a whole flux of emotions and different people in different classes are going to feel different things. But I think what we are seeing is that that desire to get along with life isn't something that's just unique to China. But I do think it's something that does weigh in on how the public is responding now to the abandonment of zero COVID. But even with that imperative to get on with living and and simply be able to pay the bills, is there a, a political cost to the party, by which I mean such strict rules governing life for years and then suddenly nothing. Does it make those restrictions and the hardships seem for nothing? Yeah, I think in terms of the political ramifications of the abandonment of zero COVID, I think it's helpful to not think of China's reaction or the Chinese social reaction as a whole, but to break it down into different segments of society. And I think perhaps that anger and even disillusionment that some people may feel with the abandonment of zero COVID, I think it matters most politically within the uh, elites in China. By that I mean the political elites, the business elites, and the intellectual academic elites as well. And that's um, not to slight the feelings and views of other people, but these political and business elites in particular, the people who have the clearest understanding of how government works, And of course, if they're officials, they're also working for the government, so they've seen it from the inside. So they've seen both the the operation of government and just how much pressure was put on local governments and on businesses to conform with these policies. And now a lot of them are also feeling, what was all that for? You know, I think one of the underlying factors that has led to the abandonment of zero COVID in the end that we haven't mentioned already, is simply the enormous expenditure of finances and people that it imposed on local governments across China. And that was an effort that a lot of local officials felt a personal cost in as well. You know, they were spending a lot of time from their other work, but also from their families, uh, with this demand to impose zero COVID policies right down to the very finest corners of Chinese society and Chinese neighbourhoods. And that was a massive mobilisation effort that required millions of officials on the ground. And I suspect for that for some of them, you know, you get the feeling sometimes that they're also a bit baffled, like, what was all of that for? Where did it go? But baffled is one thing. Is there resentment? Is there real political cost? That's something we have to wait and see. I think partly it depends on what happens with COVID spread now. You know, after the initial abandonment of zero COVID, we did see this um, massive rise in cases. It was extraordinary the number of people who very quickly reported that they believed they had COVID or had caught COVID. It seemed that virtually no family, certainly in cities, was spared. And the death toll is very difficult to estimate. Um, China's official numbers in the tens of thousands are really not credible. But exactly how many people have perished is very difficult to estimate. A million seems like a plausible number, but could be much more, could be a bit less. But the question now is, is there going to be a sustained wave of subsequent infections? I think if there isn't, if China's fortunate enough to avoid that, 
then the political damage may also be limited as well. It will be in the background, but it will be more limited. If we do see subsequent waves of infections, then I think it becomes a much more complicated issue for the Chinese government, in particular if those infections begin to take away uh, more elderly people who perhaps were spared in the first wave. What we've seen um, subsequent to the abandonment of zero COVID, as I said, is a, a massive initial wave, but it does seem to have died down significantly to judge both from official reports, but also to talking people from the ground. So uh, China's been lucky so far, and you know one hopes for a Chinese people certainly that they're spared subsequent infections, and if they are, I think the government will be politically relieved as well. Another key area of policy reversal is the real estate and the property sector, and we had a crackdown on developers with things like caps on lending in 2021. And now we've got, uh, you know, sweeping directives to try and rescue the sector, easing access, more credit, loosening down payment requirements and all of this, even though there really is still very significant concern about the level of debt in the development sector. So I guess my first question, Chris, is did the initial restrictions have the desired outcome? Well, the initial restrictions were certainly biding on the property sector and without claiming any expertise in the area, it was certainly clear that the Chinese government was on a concerted drive to reduce the debt levels and financial risk in the property sector, even at the cost of slower growth. But then I think the problem was, as we've been talking about with the zero COVID policies, the double weight of those zero COVID policies together with the restrictions on the property sector and problems in the other areas of the economy, including the tech sector, that all became a bit too much. And particularly with rising youth unemployment and also reduced revenues going through to the government, I think that's when it became clearer to the Chinese leadership that while they may be committed longer term to cleaning up the property sector and reducing its importance in the economy in the longer term, in the shorter term they need it to survive as a generator of economic growth, as a generator of jobs, and in particular as a generator of government revenues as well. So we have seen a reversal, uh, which may help the property sector for a year or two, but then I see even investors and economists aren't so sure that the Chinese property sector can return to the boom years of um, previous decades. So I think the government has given the property sector a shot in the arm for a while, for a year or two. But after that, what happens with the property sector, I think, is much less certain and much more open to speculation about whether we'll see it, not going into the drastic freeze of the past couple of years, but certainly beginning to slow down again. This is another sector, isn't it, that saw protests not quite at the level or so widely publicised outside the country is the COVID protests. But for quite a while now, there have been sort of sporadic protests by people who simply had all their money tied up in a property that either wasn't finished or they couldn't access. Yes, I think that's true. And the other thing about the property sector is that the Chinese government's efforts are about reducing debt levels, especially in these big companies like Evergrande that have gotten into serious trouble. I think there's also a less noted campaign underway to change the way in which the property and real estate sector works so that this model that the sector has has been driven by for a long time of build it and they will come or promise to build it and they will come and buy, that that has to change and that to maintain the confidence of Chinese consumers that they're actually going to receive the home that they pay money down for and have something to move in quickly, in particularly when they have a mortgage. Um, I think the Chinese government is going to try to move toward a, a situation in which housing providers are much more expected to have stock on hand that buyers can go look at and decide to buy or not. And then move in. And then move in quickly, rather than acting on this promise that a unit may be available and ready to move into in a year or two. I think the government's beginning to realise that that is just a source of economic problems, particularly when these companies get into serious trouble without finishing units, but also, as you said, a source of political and social discontent as well. 
And if we move to the tech sector, another very big commercial sector in late 2020, we saw a crackdown. Some officials are now hailing that as uh, quote unquote basically over, whether or not it is, I guess we can get to in a minute. But what what did that crackdown look like and, and what led to it in the first place? Yeah, again, there I always caveat my comments on the economy with saying I'm going into unfamiliar territory. But I think what we do see in the property sector and the tech sector is a feature of Chinese government these days, which is, especially under Xi Jinping, I think what we do see is how policy can be implemented in this very intense campaign style in which the top leadership enunciates these broad goals, such as reining in ill-disciplined tech entrepreneurs who aren't listening to the government. And that broad message galvanizes the Chinese government in different departments at different levels to act on that broad demand. And officials come under a lot of pressure to show that they're acting on what Xi Jinping wants done. And I think that's what we saw in the tech sector as well. You know, again, there was a convergence of different factors coming into play. Part of it at the broadest political level, is the party leaderships and in particular Xi Jinping's underlying suspicion that if these tech entrepreneurs get too big for their boots, they're going to become a political problem for the government. They're not going to listen to regulatory demands. They're going to push back against official expectations when it comes to how policy is implemented, um, censorship and content provision online and so on. So they needed to be sent a sharp warning. I think part of it, though, is also something that needs to be acknowledged, that regulators were also actually getting concerned that some of these big companies had grown very big very quickly and were abusing their dominance in markets, in particular on these tech platforms. And so I think that came into play as well. And then also these anxieties that we saw, particularly in the education sector, and the gaming sector, in which the party leadership is worried about something else, which is the education and upbringing of Chinese children and young people, and this fear that they're spending too much time online, that they're spending too much time on games, um, and when they're not spending too much time on games, their parents are making them go to these for-profit after-school tutorial classes to make sure that they do well in exams. So all those social anxieties also came into play. So you get this convergence of political anxieties, regulatory worries, and also social anxieties that really added up to an intense campaign against the tech sector. I think one that some officials may acknowledge looking back now went a bit too far and really scared investment in that sector to the point where we've seen it shedding jobs. And that added to the political pressures that we saw on the Chinese government um, in the past few months. And if we look at the the case of Jack Ma, for example, the founder of Alibaba and Ant Group, he in many ways seems to have been, if you're talking about giving the tech entrepreneurs sharper warnings, he seems to have got the sharpest. Can you give us a, a little sense of what happened to him as an example? Well, as the um, crackdown was getting underway, as you say, Ali, one of the signal events in the crackdown was the Chinese government stepping in and basically telling Ant Financial that its plans to list have to um, go by the sideboard for the time being. And they put in all sorts of demands and requests on that. At the same time, there's rhetoric reflecting Xi Jinping's words about investment and capital, which is ill-disciplined, is wild, to use the Chinese phraseology that was used. In other words, this idea that tech entrepreneurs in particular, they weren't listening to the government and they were expanding into areas that they shouldn't be. And with all of that coming down, Jack Ma got the message and he went very quiet for a while, went abroad for some time. But in fact, he still is abroad. As as we record this, he he is uh, currently in Australia, is the understanding. Oh, okay. He's been moving around. <laughs> it seemed to be He has the, been moving around, yeah. It seemed to be the Mediterranean and then Hong Kong and now Australia of all places. So there he is. Um, at the same time, of course, he's, he's indicated that he's going to be formally entirely retiring from Alibaba now, his other big company. And I think that's a sign that he recognises that both he wants to move on to other enterprises now, but also he's, you know, he became such a big target for 
attention in China, but also for official attention that it is time for him to move on. I'm sure with a hope in mind that eventually that Ant Financial can list in some form, even if it's going to be a much more modest listing with more modest ambitions than it was initially. Indeed, that Ant Group, which is a big fintech, it's had a business restructure. Do you think that the message has been received loud and clear in the sector? I'm pretty sure that it has. And one reason we can tell that is because a lot of these big tech firms have been hurting economically, uh, shedding lots of jobs. Thousands of uh, young people who thought they were set on a the start of a career in the tech sector as programmers, as support staff for these big tech companies have found themselves laid off. So these companies are going through a degree of financial pain at the moment. And I would expect that they're hoping that they can find a, a sounder economic footing in the next year or two, simply because the, the digital sector is just so important in the Chinese economy now. I'm sure, as you know, Ali, anybody who's spent time in China knows just how ubiquitous these companies like Alipay are now, how many people rely on them for you know, online payments, for travel, for day-to-day consumer transactions, like the cash economy has really shrunk in China. And so these companies may be contrite now, and they're certainly going to be mindful of what the government wants them to do. But they're also extremely important to the Chinese economy as well. So I think on the other side of it, there has been a recognition from the Chinese government that, yes, we do need these companies as drivers for growth going forward. And if we're talking, Chris, about this as a, if not a policy reversal, then it, then definitely a, a recalibration now that the point has been has been made. As we record this, which is the 22nd of February, there's real concern around the disappearance of the founder of a very well-known Chinese investment bank, which has been really key to financing Chinese tech. The, the name of the bank is China Renaissance and the founder is Bao Fan. He's disappeared, and as I said, do you think that that is an indicator that maybe there is not a reversal or or a change of heart around tech? Do you do you have any sense of whether the Balfun case is very particular uh, to China Renaissance, or do you think it's indicative of of something broader? Well, I think it's uh, simply indicative of a basic lesson about policy in China, which is. Fundamental reversals are extremely rare. What is much more common is recalibration of policy, in which it's not a complete abandonment of what happened before, but dialing back. And when you dial back, it is true that there will be possibly few entrepreneurs who feel under political trouble or who are detained, but it means that those risks remain and that investigators, whether they're anti-corruption investigators or investigating other things, are still going to have some remit to go after people. And in this case, it's been Bao Fan, who's been around for a long time, as you say, highly respected in this sector as well, very important in a lot of startups in China. I think one reason why there's been a lot of concern about his case is it did seem for a long time he, he has been a very savvy player and he knew how the system worked. And he had been doing well for himself and for Renaissance as well. And the fact that he's disappeared as well, I think, has sent a very chilling reminder of people that while things may have been, as I say, recalibrated, recalibration does not mean reversal or abandonment. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at Melbourne Asia asiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by China scholar and New York Times chief China correspondent Chris Buckley. We're talking about recent policy shifts in China and what political impact, if any, they may have on the nation's leadership. Chris, just to continue that point about recalibration, not necessarily re- reversal, the one thing about this recalibration is that it really does serve as a reminder, doesn't it, to everyone, particularly, I guess, the private sector, that the party can and does 
control these sectors, whether it's health, whether it's property, whether it's tech. That's true. I think on the other side, Ali, though, I think it also reflects a a recognition on the part of the Chinese leadership and Xi Jinping that the party in many ways depends on these sectors as well. And by that I mean that if uh, Xi Jinping wants to carry forward with these grand ambitions for nation building in China, for building up the Chinese military, for anti-poverty campaigns in China, for his ideas of common prosperity, a more egalitarian society in China in coming decades, uh, all of that costs money. And that money has to come from somewhere. And as things are in China, it does come from these sectors of the economy. So what we have seen is, yes, as we often see with recalibration, uh, a recognition on the part of the business sector that the uh, party really does um, hold the whip. But I think we've also seen that recognition on the part of the party leadership, uh, at least for the time being, that they can't be too presumptuous about how far they can push the private sector in going along with all of these changes. And if they do push too far, they may be able to get away with it, but there will be a cost to the broader economy, which will then cost the government longer term in in the resources, the finances that it can bring to bear on its longer term goals. It's longer term goals, but also does this circle back to party and, and political legitimacy? I mean, is it the case that the party is so powerful and so entrenched that it doesn't matter if it reverses policy? Or is it that that economic imperative that drives political legitimacy, that they understand that, and that it's not just about funding their own long-term policy goals, it's about maintaining that political legitimacy? Yeah, the, the, this whole question of political legitimacy in China sometimes puzzles me and I'm never quite sure what I think of it as well in the sense that the party can't entirely ignore public opinion in China or elite opinion. At the same time, when it comes to these big decisions in China, certainly with the abandonment of zero COVID, that the Chinese leadership can get away with an awful lot and if not get away entirely scot-free, then reverse the official narrative in ways that would be almost unthinkable in other societies. And I wouldn't say they've got entirely gotten away with it this time. I think there is a lot of underlying scepticism about the way in which zero COVID has been abandoned. At the same time, as we've been saying already, you know, those protests that were such a big deal late last year, they haven't come back. What we've seen since then is a much stronger effort by the government to ensure that protesters don't go out on the streets again. From a security point of view? From a security point of view and from a propaganda point of view. But we've also seen the fact that spark that lit a brush fire of protest from late October last year really hasn't returned for now. And that doesn't speak to the fact that Chinese people's attitudes have fundamentally changed, but I do think it speaks to the fact that the Communist Party, when it wants to control things when it dedicates the resources and the focus to doing that, it can be a very formidable barrier to any questioning of its legitimacy turning into protest. Just going back to that question of legitimacy that you said puzzles you, I wonder, do you think that that off-sighted, which I just did, uh, you know, association between the economic well-being, the pact that the government has with the people, that you can uh, lift yourself up economically, do you think it is as simple as that? Economic well-being leads to political legitimacy? Is your questions around that because it's not such a simple link? Yeah, I tend to think it's it's a whole combination of factors and certainly academics will spend an awful lot of time trying to <laughs> untangle what creates legitimacy and what creates it in China. I do think we have seen that this idea that there's some sort of simple conveyor belt between the level of GDP growth and the amount of support for the Chinese Communist Party is not a good way of thinking about it. There's all sorts of factors that come into play. One of them is the economy more broadly understood, but it's the economy as it generates jobs for people, as it generates a sense of broader well-being, as it generates uh, opportunities for upward mobility particularly if you're in the countryside or if you're in a smaller city or from a blue-collar job or from a farming job. I think that's the way in which economic growth can generate a sense of legitimacy in China. 
the other way in which it can generate a sense of legitimacy in China, which I think is important, is that while I think it's generally true, of course, that Chinese people do want a better life for themselves and for their children, part of the party's legitimacy or support in the population derives from this sense that the party is an agent not just for uplifting individuals and their families, but also for the country as a whole. So in other words, I do think it's generally true that a lot of Chinese people do like to feel prouder about the progress that their country is making. They do like the idea that China is becoming a more powerful and respected superpower in the world. Although Chinese people can have a variety of opinions on all sorts of issues, I do think it's generally true that that patriotic nationalist message does have a lot of purchase in China. And so I do think that that message is an important part of what we'll call legitimacy as well. But of course, to do all of that, to create a stronger military, to project Chinese influence in the world, to carry out big projects like Belt and Road, Chinese government also needs finances. So that's the other way in which the economy uh, translates into legitimacy is by underwriting those big nation-building projects as well and underwriting that sense among Chinese people that While other countries may be struggling economically, and China is at the moment, longer term, their future seems more promising. When we talk about uh, pride in in a country and its position, particularly on a global stage, it it brings us to the shift in foreign relations. And as you say, that does predate the reversal on COVID. But Beijing has wound back its wolf warrior rhetoric, even with the recent tensions over the Chinese balloon that was shot down over the United States. How how do you read the tone of foreign policy from Beijing? As we were saying, Ali, I do think there were signs of a recalibration in foreign policy that predated the party congress in which she got his third term. We don't have to go too far to see that. I think even with China-Australia relations, we saw how even before the party congress, we did see both sides moving toward putting under control some of the uh, tensions that had been troubling the relationship for a good number of years. And we also saw over that period, and certainly after the Party Congress, very quickly afterward, an effort by the Chinese government to start reaching out, not just to Australia, but also certainly the United States and the Biden administration, European countries such as Germany and France as well, and also uh, Japan and other Asian neighbours as well. We don't know what was happening behind the scenes in the party headquarters, but it does seem to reflect a, a rethink and perhaps a recognition that, particularly with the isolation of the zero COVID years, China had become too estranged, particularly from Western powers, and that it was time for China to move to a different footing, not one in which I think any side expected a fundamental resolution of all of the tensions that have been building up in many of those relationships, but to one in which they were under more managed control and there was at least some room for more uh, dialogue, if not active cooperation. So that's what we've seen. But as you've mentioned already, particularly with this extraordinary blow up with the United States over a Chinese espionage balloon, or China calls it a scientific research balloon, what we have seen is um, further proof that even with these attempts at resetting policy, those underlying tensions remain very much an active part about shaping where these relationships are going. And particularly with the uh, relationship with the United States, we've seen these efforts that Xi Jinping and President Biden made from their meeting in Bali in November last year onward, these efforts that they were making to put relations on a sounder footing to open up more dialogue between the two sides, those efforts, I wouldn't say they've been entirely destroyed, but they're certainly on hold for the time being with all of the ill will that suddenly became exposed over this balloon mini-crisis that erupted. Ali, I do think the message again there is one that even when there can be Changes in policy, they do tend to be more in the form of recalibration, shifting the center of gravity when it comes to China's priorities rather than wholesale abandonment of where policy was before. When you look at those tensions, and I completely take your point about uh, obviously, you know, the visit of the Secretary of State was cancelled. However, the the Secretary of State has met China's senior foreign policy uh, spokesperson on the the sidelines of the Munich Security 
conference. So there have been meetings. It would seem that the deterioration in relations, you would have thought perhaps a year ago would have been far rapid and far more uh, severe than it has been. Is that a fair comment? If the balloon incident had happened 12 months ago. No, I think that's a very good point, Ali, and I think you're right there. It's probably true that throughout this year, despite the trouble over the balloon, both sides, the United States government and the Chinese government, do want to keep a hold on tensions and make sure that they don't go too far. I think each side has its um, particular reasons for that. On the Chinese side, I think one of them is the economy, and they don't want to spook international markets or domestic investors and consumers by having another major crisis. That is one factor that does weigh on leaders perhaps more than, say, 12 months ago. We're talking about what's been happening in China, but it's also the fact that there have been changes in the United States that make the relationship much more delicate and somewhat brittle as well. You know, with the midterm elections, the Republican Party now has a slight majority in the House of Representatives, of course, and I think we have seen that they have been very vocal on the China issue, including Taiwan, and that makes it more difficult for the Biden administration to manage relations with China as well. I think we have seen them being, throughout the balloon incident, reflecting sensitivity about where American opinion is on China at the moment and needing to show that they are standing up against China when American opinion expects the administration to take that position. <laughs> We're almost out of time, Chris. But when we look at that, the fact that the economy underwrites, I guess, the, the policy ambitions, uh, the party can't do anything if it hasn't got the, the money to do it. And so I take the practical side of that. But when when these recalibrations are happening, however sensible they may seem because of the various imperatives, is there a an element, do you think, of internal reckoning? I am asking you to read the tea leaves here, but do you think that there are tussles between ideology and, and pragmatism? I think there are those tussles, Ali, and I think there are also those tussles, so to speak, inside Xi Jinping's head. In other words, I think sometimes these gyrations that we see in Chinese policy, in the economy, in foreign policy, in politics they can reflect different parts of the Chinese government trying to figure out where their priorities are, offering different views about the balance between, you know, standings tall ideologically and, and making pragmatic choices. But I also think we do see sort of Xi Jinping himself has sort of offering these contradictory policy imperatives that reflect the fact that even within his thinking there can be sort of jostling priorities and sometimes those ideological priorities can come to the fore. Sometimes we see a somewhat more pragmatic Xi Jinping coming to the fore. And then the problem is, of course, is that Chinese officials working under Xi Jinping, just like us, have to read the tea leaves and have to read where his thinking is heading, anticipate what he wants, and then craft policy that reflects those priorities. So I think you're right, Ali. I, I think we do see these struggles in policy. I do think it's sometimes helpful, though, to think not just of them as being struggles within factions within the party or anything like that, but also struggles within the party's competing own priorities and ultimately within Xi Jinping's own priorities. Is there any sense of recalibration meaning failure? Uh, on its own terms, Ali, the Chinese Communist Party never fails. Every reversal is simply another step forward. And, of course, that's what we've seen the party doing with COVID policy, for example, there hasn't been any recognition that the abandonment of zero COVID marked any sort of failure or dysfunction on the part of Chinese policy making. On the contrary, what we saw earlier this month is Xi Jinping bring together the Politburo Standing Committee, the seven most powerful officials in China, to hear a report on zero COVID policy and announce that it was a sweeping success and that by holding out with zero COVID for so long, the Chinese Communist Party spared China the many millions of deaths that other countries have experienced. So the implicit message there is that even with that drastic reversal in policy, it was part of the party's grand plan. Do you see that there'll be any significance to look for at the uh, in early March, the, the upcoming National People's Congress, to see whether there has been any impact of these shifts 
on Xi Jinping or you don't think that that's something we need to look for? No, I think it's something to pay attention to with the National People's Congress um, in March, Ali. And this is where we always have to remind people the National People's Congress is very different from the Party Congress. This is the annual legislative exercise in China. And this is where the government will lay out its goals for 2023. So people will be looking very carefully, particularly at economic policy and the extent to which this reversal of policy that we've been talking about is now embedded in the policy settings for the rest of the year. I think that's what a lot of people will be looking for. And also looking for any signs, and I'm not saying we expect these signs, but any signs that all of this... um, trouble, discontent, dissension, confusion in policy over the past few months translates into any political pushback against Xi Jinping. In particular there, it seems very likely, seems almost a given, that Xi Jinping will be claiming a third term as China's state president. So he's already a third term as party leader, now he wants a third term as president as well. The 3,000 or so delegates to the National People's Congress at the end of the Congress get to vote on that. In last years, I think when Xi Jinping claimed the presidency, I seem to remember it was a unanimous vote or close to unanimous. If there's even a scattering of abstentions this time or, God forbid, no votes when Xi Jinping's third term as presidency comes up, I think that would be something that a lot of people pay attention to. I guess I'm not expecting that to happen just given the pressure and discipline within the Congress these days and how it operates. But people will be paying close attention to that. Just a final question, Chris. I wonder whether you agree with Australia's former Prime Minister and soon-to-be ambassador to the US, Kevin Rudd, who incidentally or not incidentally completed a PhD on Xi Jinping's worldview. He says China's shifts should not be seen as a sign of Xi Jinping giving up his ideological battle with the West. The quote is, the political guardrails remain firmly in place for what might now be done in the name of restoring economic growth. So for all the the trouble, the confusion, the dissension, the recalibration, do you agree the political guardrails have gone nowhere? So if I understand Mr Rudd correctly, he's saying that China's longer term agenda and this increasing confrontation with the Western bloc is going to continue. Is that right? Yes. I mean, he's talking about the ideological battle with the West. There is no, I suppose, softening in the worldview. I I think that's generally true, Ali. I I do think it's probably at this point we should remind the audience of something else that we haven't really discussed so far, but is really important in understanding the direction of policy in China, which is the direction of the Ukraine war. China does have a very close relationship with Russia and in particular Xi Jinping's um, brother in authoritarian values, uh, Vladimir Putin. And what happens with that war will have ramifications, of course, for Russia. But what happens for Russia, whether it faces defeat, uh, drastic reversal, or possibly some kind of victory or at least um, fighting to a standstill in Ukraine, that will have all sorts of knock-on effects also for Russia's relationship with China, but also think in indirectly as well for um, Xi Jinping's sense of how confident he feels that China has the domestic wherewithal, but also the external support to continue on a policy of assertiveness or possible confrontation with the United States and its allies. Now, if Russia suffers of his serious defeat, in some ways uh, Xi Jinping may feel even more beleaguered and surrounded by Western powers. Uh, So there would be all sorts of complications that arise from the outcome in Ukraine. I think when it comes to judging where China is headed, we also need to pay close attention to what happens in Ukraine. Yeah, and I suppose pertinent to that, uh, the fact that Russia signed a no-limits friendship with China on the eve of the invasion. And we just saw in the past week, again, recording this on February the 22nd, the US warning that China may be preparing to send uh, weapons and ammunition to Russia. It's a it's a very delicate game that China plays in relation to Ukraine, isn't it? Very delicate game that China has to play with Ukraine and Russia, and we see that playing out now. And I think more broadly that speaks to the fact that while Xi Jinping may take a very bleak view of um, relations with the United States in the longer term, it's also a very delicate game that he has to play with the United States 
uh, Japan, Australia and other allies as well. And that comes back to technology. The other thing you were talking about, Ali, when it comes to advanced technology, China does still need access to Western know-how. So that's another factor that comes into play. We could do a whole other podcast on that particular topic and and uh, and where Ukraine may go. But Chris Buckley, thank you so much uh, for your insights and for being so generous with your time and for talking to us on Ear to Asia. Uh, my pleasure, Ali. Always happy to talk. Our guest has been China scholar and New York Times chief China correspondent, Chris Buckley. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on social media. This episode was recorded on the 22nd of February 2023. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.